Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Creepy Backwoods Stories. Also, I want to mention that we are still trying to raise money for the National Center for Victims of Crimes. It will be mentioned in every video this month, so please click the link down below this video and donate if you can. But now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. Two years ago, I went to visit family up in northern Minnesota around Labor Day weekend. I will not give the exact location, but will provide at least a general location where this happened. To keep this short, I'm hoping someone may have had a similar experience, or may have a general idea what this thing or entity was walking around our tent. The general location was Mary Brown Bridge in Monaga, Minnesota. On that Labor Day weekend, my girlfriend and I were planning on spending time camping with her family. Both of us were very excited to get away from the everyday city life and anticipated a much needed low key weekend. We arrived at their location around noon on Sunday and were warm greeting by everyone there. During the day and evening, we were enjoying ourselves with random fun activities and catching up on how everyone was doing. At dusk, we started to settle in. We all were near the campfire for a few hours until 11 p.m. Eventually, the family and ourselves called it a night and headed to bed. My girlfriend and I were offered to sleep in a bigger size six person earlier that day from whom her relative, who I will call Mary. It was a kind gesture at the time as we only brought a two person size tent. Having that additional space for our belongings and our air mattresses was a nice added feature. Mary's tent was positioned not too far from the campfire and the rest of the family. The family did a wonderful job clearing and maintaining the area for their smaller RVs and additional tents. To the back of the tent, about 20 to 30 yards, is where the woods started with semi-thick brush and trees. Us three were lying down chatting, and eventually they both fell asleep. For some reason I couldn't sleep, so I was on my phone passing time hoping to eventually drift off to sleep. This is when I heard faint activity in the woods about 40 yards back. I dismissed it right away, as deer are known in this area, and continued to space off on my phone looking at random things. About 10 or 20 minutes later, I heard something get close to our tent. I could distinctly hear twigs snapping and moving between bushes, getting closer to our tent slash clearing. This started to get my attention, as I could start physically feeling a faint shake in the ground as this thing or entity was wandering around. Moments later, this thing was about 10 yards away from our tent, walking and running back and forth. Each step this thing took, I could physically feel the vibration from the ground. This thing was big. Best way to describe this feeling is if you went to a live rock concert and felt the kick drum hit your body. At this point, I was a bit terrified as I was trying to follow the footsteps running slash walking at the back of the side of the tent. This entity or thing got at least five yards near our tent and suddenly stopped near Mary's side of the tent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, scared of what this thing was going to do next. I kid you not, a few seconds later Mary shot up from being dead asleep. She gasped for air, and was calling our names to wake us up. You could hear in her voice that she was terrified. This entity hightailed off back to the woods. Both of us were very startled at this point. The woods were dead silent, and eventually we had the courage to look out the tent. We saw and heard nothing, and about 30 minutes later ran to their shop to grab a shotgun. Another anomaly during this whole thing while we were alert and awake. Mary mentioned during the time that I was awake she was having a dream. She mentioned these entities were tormenting her, saying they want her soul, or that they wanted to kill her, and to give it to them. My girlfriend dismissed the whole thing and said it was probably just a deer running around. After hearing my girlfriend said that, I never told anyone about this story. Until recently, 
as I started to think about it again, trying to figure out what the heck this thing was. My fiance and I hiked into some forest in Ontario. We had a friend drop us off at the side of an old logging road in the middle of nowhere, and we hiked into the woods due east. The road ran north and south, so basically, all we had to do was stay due east hiking in, and due west hiking out, and we would reach the road again for our rendezvous at a predetermined time a couple of days later. There are no natural predators this far south, such as bears or wolves. So for protection, I only brought a K-Bar knife and some bear spray, in case coyotes took an interest in our two dogs that accompanied us. The logging road was no longer in use by any industry, and we had hiked into the woods a few kilometers, so the chances of running into another human were nil. In addition, hunting is not permitted in the area, and there is no water nearby for fishing. There really wasn't any reason for anyone else to be out there in the middle of the woods for that far off the road. No cell service, although I did bring a flare gun and multiple flares in case we ran into trouble to signal for help. No GPS, just a compass. We were careful hiking in and didn't do anything risky to avoid injuries in this remote place. It was early fall, but it was unseasonably cold, well below freezing. Lots of leaves on the ground and still on the trees, but no snow yet. We set up camp in some thick woods. You could barely see 50 feet away, the trees and bushes were so dense. We were totally isolated and felt completely safe. It was so cold and so dark at night, it was moonless and cloudy, that we went to bed early to stay warm. I'm a heavy sleeper, and the next thing I know I'm awakened by my dog pawing at my face. It's pitch black and I can't even see him. I go to pet him, but something is wrong. As I touched him... I could feel his fur standing straight up, and he was completely rigid, facing the door of the tent. He was clearly on guard and very alert. At first, I assumed there was a woodland creature nearby, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That's unusual, because I often camp alone no problem, and am not easily spooked. My dog and I just stayed there, frozen and alert, for at least a couple of minutes. My fiancé and other dog were still asleep next to us. It was 3.30 a.m. I checked my phone after the incident. The fire was out. No moon. Complete blackness. Just as I was letting my guard down, I hear the most unexpected thing. A notification going off on a phone just outside of our tent. Maybe 15 to 20 feet away, and I see a faint glow. I hear a male voice utter, Oh, F or something to that effect, and hear them running through the leaves away from our tent. They were clearly smacking into tree branches, etc., and swearing as they did so. At this point, they turn on their flashlight as they run, and I can see the beam flailing wildly around in the woods, occasionally back onto our tent. The dogs start going ballistic. I grab my knife and look at my phone. It's 3.30 a.m. I screamed out, If you come back here... I'll blow your head off. I'm assuming he had a satellite phone, a really good cell service to get a notification like that. The other weird thing was, he fled deeper into the woods in nothingness, not west towards the logging road. Needless to say, we packed up in the cold and hiked back to the road, watching our backs the entire time. We just walked down the road towards far off civilization until we ran into some other campers set up right next to the road, seven or eight kilometers away from where we came out of the woods. It was just after first light. They let us use their satellite phone, and we called our friend to come pick us up a day early. Upon hearing our story, the campers decided they would pack up as well and get out of the area. Lesson learned. I do not camp in the wilderness anymore without a satellite phone and a 12-gauge shotgun.
backpacking slash camping with my family of four near a river in a remote canyon in a very wild area last summer was quite blissful until waking up around 2 a.m. to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks very close to the river, and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us towards the wall of the canyon. It was regular, occurring like clockwork every 15 to 20 seconds. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening it away from us. There was no moon out, and we could see very little, but shining our flashlights around revealed nothing as well. It sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all, and it seemed relentless and unfazed by us in every way. I worried it was rabbit or hurt. At one point, I heard it near the river on the other side of us, and was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around us without hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn with my knife in hand, waiting for a wild slash sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, and I have to fight for our lives. Finally, around dawn, the sounds get less frequent and eventually stopped. After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds, and the closest we could find to what we were hearing was a mountain lion mating call. Definitely lions in that area, so I believe that's what we heard. Still confused as to why it stayed so very close to us, and was not scared away as most animals would be. We've seen black bear in this area many times, and they have always run the other way on seeing humans, and cats are even more elusive. To set the scene, it was last Sunday, November 27th, and I'm walking through the woods to avoid interacting with guests, like the average antisocial teenager that I am. I have one of my uncle's dogs with me, Duke, a 150 pound Great Dane, as we're passing through a clearing. Now, I state the size and breed of the dog to demonstrate how out of character his behavior will be. As we get about halfway through the clearing, he begins to walk slower and begin to whine. I assume he hurt his paw, so I check him over, but find nothing. I turn around, and in my flashlight beam I can see a pair of eyes about four feet off the ground, significantly taller than anything with eye shine in my area. I, understandably, freak the hell out, and start to back away. Then the most horrifying thing happens. It stands up. Whatever was watching me is now over six feet tall. And then it talked. It said help, with no emotion or cadence behind it. Duke is losing his mind trying to get away, and I decide that that's a reasonable plan. As we're running through the forest trying to get back to our house, I can hear the creature saying help, 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 always five seconds apart. We mercifully make it back to the house and get inside. For the next few nights, I looked out my window and I could still see those same eyes gazing into my soul from the woods. I don't know if it was a skinwalker, a wendigo, or what the hell it was, but I hope I never see it again. Also, to answer some questions you may have, this occurred in northern Oklahoma. There was no discernible gender to the voice, and there was no discernible evidence when I went back the next day. I grew up 10 kilometers outside of a small village in mid-north Sweden, close by a lake and I played and biked around in the woods all throughout my life. I always had a kind of creepy feeling, but I know these areas so well. One night, five years ago, me and two friends walked out through the woods. 
pitch black outside, we just used our phone lights to see the trails to go sit by the lake and smoke. On our way back, we see some flashing, waving lights in the corner of the eye, maybe 50 meters away. No sound at all. We don't hear anyone. No footsteps or sticks being broken. And then it disappears. And I think I read somewhere on Reddit before about similar experiences. The thing is, where our house is, there is almost no neighbors. I have no idea who or what that was. Our house is located close to the lake, with almost a swamp close to it. Lots of weird noises and things growing up in nature like that. Edit. I mean, there's a few houses around us with a couple of kilometers in between, but that was during winter and past midnight. Just us and nature and that weird light. My boyfriend, Jason, a 27-year-old male, and I, a 23-year-old female, went on a month-long camping trip to multiple states. Everything had been going really well, until October 9th. We decided to ditch a campground reservation and randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin, within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far from the Keckrit Lake trailhead. We parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground closed for season. Admittedly, it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. Upon arrival, we realized the area we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had a planned campsite in Nephi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 degrees Fahrenheit. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel strange, as if we did not really know why we were doing this, as if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night. But we both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to Kekrit Lake, totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. Disappointing and eerie. Whatever. We keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a hell no kind of situation. But after he checked it out, he says it seems like a small animal crawl space. No biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching play some cards, bundle up, and decide to go to bed early around 8.30 p.m. as we plan to leave ASAP in the morning, maybe 5 a.m. We both dwindle slowly, and after what feels like 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24 p.m. I woke up with a feeling I have never experienced before. I woke up, wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in hell I was going to fall back asleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and just lie there, alert, trying to listen to anything I could hear, which was nothing. Very silent. Around 12 a.m., Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight as I did not want to feel alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep, but he suggested I just rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby and say I was very scared. This was very short-lived as Jason could not fall back asleep himself, and we ended up laying there together, trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. We agreed it was fine for us to just stick it through the night, as it was now approaching 2.30 a.m., and we had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I did not need to be frightened. Not even five minutes later, we are still wide awake, and Jason's head perks up so fast my heart jumped out of my chest, and I whispered, What is it? He replied, listen, and I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots as if someone was walking up to our tent, stopped, and then walked to the side of the tent. 
I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds. But my mind flashed a million thoughts, and for a millisecond I was convinced it was a ranger coming to tell us that we could not camp there. So I called out. Hello? My brain entirely sure I heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and burst it out of the tent for any chance to confront this person. As I knew, he heard exactly what I heard. Nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason bursted out and me after him, there was nothing there. We heard something walk up so clearly, but nothing walked away. Hardly exchanging two words, we packed up our stuff looking over our shoulders terrified, feeling watched, and booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. When we made it to our car, we locked the doors and started the descent of the mountains, almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached town about 3.30 a.m. and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night, and we are both haunted by the sound of those footsteps. Me and four of my buddies drew into a two-day hunt on a reserve. Day one, about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a fat black bear. We only had muzzle loaders. They're like a Civil War style gun. You get one shot, then you gotta reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer. So at 2 p.m. after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We find a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him, pick me up. I'll be on the road after dark. He's about seven miles away. I sat there from 2 p.m. till dark. All I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer. It was elk highway. So it gets dark and I creep down the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see, something crashes in the thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I think, huh, maybe it's a deer. So I grunt call just to get a reaction. Nothing. So I creep on it, thinking I can bust it if it is a deer. It doesn't budge. He's just sniffing like a dog. Sniff. 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 I kick the ground and stop trying to bump it. It just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear, and I'm ten feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me, with my one shot at my hip. I'm going to have to hip shoot it if it's a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot. A big bull elk off to my right in the full moonlight. I see something dive out of the bushes, into the thicket across the road, to my left, so I run further out. It's a standoff. I shine my light into the thicket, and I see eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart, four foot off the ground. It's just sniffing over and over. I'm like... Where's my bro? It's full dark, and this thing is stalking me using cover. My buddy's lights start shining down the road, and this thing crashes through the bushes away. I figure it's a bear, but I don't know. I was turtle heading, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark. Coyotes howling like crazy, too. Predators were out in full effect on a full moon night. At the time, I was a 20-year-old female, and I had just moved alone to a small town in upstate New York. I had grown up in another slightly larger town about 60 miles away, and just wanted a new start. I love camping. I often go camping in the Adronox. But at that time, I hadn't quite made the friends yet to go camping with. 
so I wasn't going to go to the real woods alone. Down the road from me, I had been walking and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right of the house where I thought that people wouldn't mind if I walked up the trail that the power lines make. Not sure about other countries, but in the U.S. they keep power lines clear in case maintenance is necessary. So I wander up there, noticing how it's actually pretty deep woods, and I can get far enough from the house that I saw on the road that they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in or anything. Bing. Idea. I could go camping up there. It's secluded enough to give the real woods experience, but close enough to the road that I wouldn't be in any real danger of wildlife or anything. Okay, sweet. So I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I access by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turn left onto what seemed like to be a deer trail. Deer are everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this really nice, flat, grassy clearing. I built my fire off to the side, after making sure to clear the dead wood, etc. I'm feeling really smart and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, so I had always had at least one camping companion. But eh, whatever. Next day, I decide to wander further down the path to see where it leads. I walk for about a half an hour, and I can see some fields on the right but they're in the distance, and there's a fence between the fields and the path. So again, I figure people can't be mad at me for being here. Then I came across another path, heading to the right. I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly, and there's an old van on the left of the path. Well, that's strange, but it's about 1 p.m., near noon anyway. Broad daylight. Birds are chirping, so I feel no danger. I go up to the van which had obviously been there a very long time. It was 70s style. Made me think of the Scooby-Doo van, and way overgrown with weeds. There are streaks of brownish-red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I look in and see what appears to be old bedding in the back, but it was all shredded. The curtains in the windows were shredded, and the clothing strewn about looked like it was from the 70s or early 80s. I still felt no danger signs, Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continue along the path for a short time until I finish rounding the slight bend. I stop dead in my tracks. Finally, finally, my reptile sense, or whatever you want to call it, wakes the hell up and starts screaming at me full volume. Up ahead, there is a creepy old doll hanging from the trees, by its neck, with a rope, not just stuck to the trees. Just to the left of that, there's an old garage overgrown with weeds. To the right of it, though, there is a huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-size man. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects, just kind of welded together. Some were up and down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through. Not that I tried. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Further behind it, there's a run-down house. Creeped out as all hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner. I'm a chunky girl. I had smoked for six years at that point and I do not run. But I ran that day. I don't even remember the run. I just remember coming upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put my things into the tent, ripping it out of the ground as I continued running. I left my cooler and my food behind. Never went back for it either. I dropped the tent stakes somewhere along the way, and I had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down the hill. I'm still surprised I didn't break my neck. Jumped in my car and sped home. I locked all my doors, then paced my house going, What the F? What the F? What the F. For hours. It had been 11 years since that incident. And even typing it now makes my hands shake. I now live almost 1,400 miles away. But I still just made sure my doors were locked. They are. Crazy thing is, it wasn't deep in the woods. Maybe in the 70s it was though. Who knows. As it now stands though, there are people living within a short walk of this place. And no... I know you're going to ask, 
I did not call the cops. I can't really articulate why. My best analysis looking back is that I didn't want that creep to come find me. I should have said yes. You are right. I'm hoping that it was just an old crime scene, not some sick F who still keeps people in cages in the woods. My wife and I hiked and camped quite a bit before we had our first kid. There was some backpacking, but mostly car camping that requires a good drive down a forest service road to escape people and noise. In 2016, we decided after three nights in a national forest and adjacent national park, we'd stay at an FS campsite. A change from dispersed camping, a ways from any town, but still a campsite with a bathroom. We had a wonderful time during the day, swam in a lake, yada yada, awesome place. The campsite was mostly busy, but with small families. One noteworthy group, loudish people, though well out of sight on the other side of a stand of trees. They brought many cars of all types, at least those that could drive down the road. Non paid for a good two miles, not bad though, but whatever, let people have fun. I didn't care about the noise. Come night, we went to bed early. No fire as we wake up early to hike before the sun beats down. The group is still loud. My wife does the earplugs. I'm able to ignore it and sleep. No problem. Come 1am, I wake up, perhaps due to the group noise. I don't know. I can hear fewer of them. Maybe four to five people that were audible. Enough to make out every fourth or fifth word loud drunkenness, but it was initially friendly, cursing, laughing, etc. Next thing I hear the guy call a lady a c-word, and stuff goes downhill from there. Now they are yelling expletives that I can mostly make out because of the yelling. Women and men both telling each other to f off. Luckily my wife is still out sleeping. Out of this mess of people, yelling, a woman just starts screaming, shrieking, Something changed and happened to her. This wasn't just someone joining the verbal fight. This was the first time my heart rate went up. What is happening? Even while others in the group are still yelling, I can tell the shrieking girl is moving away from the group, but is still yelling loud. Like distorting your voice yelling. Her yells turn into words. Help as she moves. And man... I can begin to tell she's getting closer to the tent site area where I am. Pause real quick. Let me give the layout of my campsite, which is key. Around one bend of a large lake, there are several camp areas, which means multiple 6-12 to campsite pods, each accessible by a walking trail. There's an area to park with each campsite near each trail. The dirt road swings around the lake to each parking area. The yelling group was in the pod next to mine not the same campsite. Screaming girl is getting closer, but it's hard to yell. Then her screams for help become clear, where I'm able to make out, help, someone is trying to stab me. I can hear her move from the road to the parking area where my car is parked, coming closer to the trailhead that connects to my campsite. In my head, I'm thinking, oh crap. Crap, 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 don't come to the trail. Don't come to the trail. My tent is the first one once you enter the trail. My wife is still sleeping through the yelling. I might sound like an asshole for not jumping up and playing the hero here, but screw that. I'm not touching drunk people drama. Sure enough, she starts down the trail. The trail splits and I'm on the right. I'm thinking, go left, go left. My wife is starting to wake up, pulls out the earplug. I turn to her. It's okay. It's okay. Nope. Yelling girl turns right, walks right up to our tent, stands next to it. Help me. Can you please help me? She's sobbing. 
I get up first and open the tent. In the twilight, and the light from the girl's phone, I can see that she is a freaking teenager. Drunk as hell. Not bleeding or stabbed, luckily. I'm tired and don't respond. Well, sputtering a bit. Saying things like, I don't know. We can't. My wife pops up and handles the situation like a boss. Calming her down. Asking her name. Sitting her down on the picnic table. De-escalating. Take a second. Imagine walking up to someone screaming help at 1am next to your tent. Not sure how my wife handled that so well. The short version of the girl's story. She is 16. Her cousin got jealous about hugging her boyfriend. Threatened and maybe tried to stab the 16 year old. All were drinking. Meanwhile, we can hear people over in the campsite continuing to rage, yelling at each other. It is now mostly just two guys yelling at each other. My wife instructs the girl to drink water and stay away from her cousin. They were going over options. I'm trying to use either of our phones, wife's and mine, to call the police. No signal. Thanks, T-Mobile. Luckily, other campers have woken up and come to our area. They have a signal and call the police. Thank God. The girl has calmed down a little bit at this point and wants to leave. We're all very wary, as we can still hear the dudes screaming at each other. The girl abruptly leaves. Wife and I, plus two other campers, are standing in the parking area near the trail, WTFing about it all. The dudes yelling in the background escalates to a fist fight. You can hear skin slaps like someone got popped, falling into bushes, shouting. The four of us sitting there, waiting for the police. This goes on for a while. 30 minutes and no police. Understandable given the location. Suddenly, the 16-year-old girl comes back. She has a half a fifth of vodka in her hand. Now she is cursing. I'm gonna F her up. I have guns. My mom has a gun at the house. My wife and the two campers whip out their negotiation skills and talk her down. Wife gets 16-year-old to give up the bottle and sit on the ground. Do you think effing her up is a good decision right now? I'm looking at my wife like, is that gonna work? Girl is like, no. I'm such a loser with my capabilities right now. I play no use for role in all of this. The teenager then reveals that her mom is on the tribal council. She said everyone in the group is going to be in trouble over this. I didn't realize, but apparently this is important stuff to people in that area. Guys in the background still yelling. A second fist fight ensues. Police finally get there. Story speeds up. In short, police get the story told to them. I see eyebrows go up when the girl mentions who her mom is. They seemingly, reluctantly, pack teenager into the car. And as soon as they move her into the car, she screams violently. Doors close and you can still hear that screaming. Fighting dudes slash the group must have seen the lights as the commotion stops. Police talks to them. Cops leave with the girl. Then it's quiet, close to 3 a.m. Shaken, the wife and I go back to our tent and discuss next steps. Should we stay? Decided we were gonna leave first thing in the morning. But while lying there as if to sleep, only five minutes later, the group again begins to shout at each other expletives more along the lines of we're effed and f you nope we're out so in the dark we quietly pack the car for some reason wife and i are concerned the group will hear us the tent goes in unfolded fast once everything is in when we start the car suddenly one of the dudes from the fighting group sprints over to our parking lot like he's about to stop us first time seeing him shirtless skinny guy in shorts I accelerate quickly towards him. He's in the middle of the lot. Then turn towards the road and get out of there. Nearly three hours of driving back to the city. I, a 27-year-old female, 
went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short, roughly one mile trail. So there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid twenties walked by carrying a fishing pole and small cruller. Didn't think much of it, but about five to 10 minutes later, he doubled back and came and said, hi, I said, hi, and went back to reading. But then without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy, amused tone like, so you're just reading? And then looked behind me and noticed my tent and said, oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it's obvious that I am. It's hard to explain, but his whole vibe was really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark and just drilling into me. I just responded with "Uh uh-huhs or yep or something and just tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls me out and cracks a beer and lights a cigarette and just starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wandered by and he strikes up a conversation with him. And I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend to need to go get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water super slowly and saw him walk away to go sit with the new guy, which made me super relieved. Except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent. And for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things when he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe one foot from my door looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but just started laughing really creepily and fakely again. I asked what, and his response was, this is just really funny. I felt literally stick to my stomach and finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily left. Later, I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and where he said he was from, while talking to the other hiker in my notes app, just in case, and slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving camp that night, but ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning in case he came back. Normally, while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is I might run into a bear or sprain my ankle. And maybe this seems not as bad as you're reading it. But this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the backcountry. I'm sure I'll be back out soon. But hopefully, somewhere far away from this dude. Excuse this long post, but I'm trying to give lots of detail and specifics on the experience. Let me first clarify that this was four years ago, when I was 15 on a muzzleloader's mule deer hunt in the far northeastern part of Utah, which contains some of the most remote and beautiful places in the state. I've been frequently out in this area, spreading in Summit County that cuts in and out of lower Wyoming since before I can remember, including lots of hiking, backpacking, camping, hunting, and being involved in some of my grandfather's work. I am skeptical of things not proven by methods of science, but I don't deny all of those things. I find that it's impossible for science to know of all that is out there in our vast world. My grandfather is a recently retired biologist and former conservation officer for the state and was a regional specialist and was over wildlife and habitat management for many years. He's done everything from habitat management programs, controlled fires to benefit areas, to quite literally wrangling moose to be transported and darting black bears. He has seen mountain lions, bears, 
birds of all kinds, small mammals, ruminants, plants, and natural phenomena for a majority of his life, and he understands so much that many people, including myself, will never be able to imagine. He's scientific, honest, straightforward, and level-headed. He's agnostic and is not superstitious and often used to, lovingly and respectingly, tease a certain CEO who thinks certain Bigfoot, skinwalkers, and other beings exist. Other than his experience, he has never encountered an animal that he could not at least partially, if not completely, identify. And other than the natural, innate fear of being in close quarters with a bear, drunken and belligerent hunter, or incredibly potent tranquilizer medication, he has told me over and over he's never been terrified of an animal or experience in his life, only curious or surprised. It was late September, and we were in a small camp by a lake in the high Uinta Mountains, hunting both grouse and mule deer with muzzle loaders. The camp was a small collection of men and women my grandfather had worked with over the years as a supervisor, biologist, and CO, and these people were people that I grew up with. One of the women, a new wife to one of the guys, had shot a buck deer, injuring but not killing it immediately, and they had lost track of it. Devastated by the thought of wasting the animal, she returned to camp in the afternoon upset and concerned that the deer had run into an even more secluded area of the mountain, which was hard to reach from the trail that she had shot it from, a place my grandfather was familiar with because it was such a pain in the butt to get to, with lots of deadfall and steep terrain. We volunteered to go in the late afternoon to search for the deer, following a scant blood trail that she had tracked for a while before getting fatigued and intimidated by the terrain. Because both my grandfather and I were in good shape and he was so familiar, it didn't seem like a big deal. Before we left, she mentioned hearing what she assumed was coyotes, which made her even more so concerned than if the deer died, they would ruin the meat and hide before she could harvest it. We took off in the early evening, expecting to be back within an hour or two after searching and having our guns with us, in case we found the animal still alive or come across another buck worth trying to harvest. It was steep in places, with lots and lots of deadfall of varying heights making the hike slower and more tedious than we had hoped, making us understand the other hunter's fatigue. She had marked the blood trail with bright orange pieces on the trees, which we followed for maybe 20 minutes, and then it got hard to track. The sun was getting close to setting at this point, and we knew getting out would be just as long as getting in. We had just about decided to stop when we spot a near-fallen tree that looked like it had been recently bedded down in, followed with spatters of fairly fresh blood, and we continued for longer. When the sun had just about set and the light had faded from the trees, we removed the firing caps from our guns to make them now completely safe, as it was now illegal and irresponsible to hunt in such absence of decent daylight. My grandfather pulled out his large maglite flashlight from his pack, and I put in my headlamp to begin the hike back using our GPS to find the trailhead. About 10 minutes on the way back, we started to hear more movement coming from the trees. It was normal for animals to start moving now that the sun had gone down, as animals would likely be starting to head towards clearings for water or to graze in the safety of lower light. Small and distant sounds of crunching leaves, patterings of hooves, animals, or small bits of movement in the trees from squirrels or birds were common and expected. We did not expect the deafening, disturbing sound we heard next, which vaguely and initially reminded me of a coyote howl, but by a few seconds it was unidentifiable, frightening and human-like. It started with what sounded like a person screaming, but then got louder and more intense with a screech to it, so unlike any coyote or any animal we have ever encountered. Then was the almost chittering that came in between the shrieks and the movement of the trees becoming almost calculated, almost threatening. We stopped dead in our tracks, frozen as my grandfather started using the light to look around. I was far more freaked out than him at this point. He just seemed perplexed, curious, and a little baffled at what could make that sound. It sounded human, but with no words, with no urge of tone of help, or I'm just screaming a mess with you. We continued on after it mostly stopped, and it seemed like the other natural and distant sounds had almost gone silent. I listened intently 
to the sound of my boots crunching with the dry aspen leaves underfoot, trying to tell myself that it was just some weird coyote with a horribly deformed larynx or something. Maybe twenty minutes from the main trail that would lead us to the truck, we heard the chittering sound again, and sounds of thumping against dead trees. Looking around with our lights in between deadfall, maybe twelve to fifteen feet in front of us, was a large human-looking thing. It was almost hunched down with long, slender arms around the front of a standing aspen. The aspen, of course, was pale white, with the knots being dark brown. And whatever it was, had skin almost as pale. I caught a very brief glimpse of its face. It seemed round, and the eyes seemed sunken, and I could not tell you the eye collar other than a flash of reflection on the eye from my light and that its face seemed sunken and emaciated. I didn't see any fur or hair. I never felt like it looked right at me, more my grandfather, and just in our direction almost confused and curious, like he was before with the sound. For a mere couple of seconds I caught a glimpse of it, but that was it. I looked down at the ground, holding my eyes shut, trying to imagine being safe and secure in the truck, and my grandfather took a few stumbling steps back towards me. I heard the thing go off to our side, moving quickly and with purpose through the trees, to the side, and then drop down behind us, I would assume, according to the sound. But I hope it went in the opposite direction. My grandfather turned to where it had veered off, asked to follow it, but he soon stopped and looked at me. I had never before and never since seen him so confused, baffled, horrified, curious, and in awe. I was crying at this point, ugly crying, trying to muffle my shaking breath and voice, and I asked him, what was that? Over and over I asked, and he had no answer for me. He pulled his gun off his shoulder and put a cap back into the nipple of the igniter, making the gun live, and he then carried it in front of his body in his arm. He pulled out another headlight to put on himself. We started walking again towards the trail as he listed off as like talking to himself as to what it wasn't. Things like, couldn't have been a deer or elk or moose. It had arms. It was hunched. It stood upright. Or a bear? A very sick bear? It could have been a bear. Was it the light? We heard the sound, the screeching human howl, distantly once more before reaching the trail, which was dirt and gravel, but fairly flat and no deadfall. We practically jogged to the truck. I locked the doors immediately and sobbed, and my grandfather turned on music as loud as possible to try to distract me on the way back to camp. I was a mess when we arrived back, and he went to talk with the others by the fire when he got me settled in my sleeping bag in my bunk. He explained to some of his friends, but I don't know what all was said. The next day, everyone was extra sweet to me, trying to comfort me and saying it was probably a sick animal that looked scary in the dark. The deer the hunter shot was found the next day in the daylight, scavenged quite harshly by what I assume was coyotes. To this day, he has no clue what it was, nor what that sound was. And before and since, I've heard both coyote and many other animal sounds that never even compared to that sound. The scientist in me, and in him, the hopeful and blissfully ignorant people in us, hope and speculate that it was a deformed, sick animal in a scant light, but I still have no clue of what that thing was, and I hope I never experience it again. Anybody have any ideas? Am I in the right place? Sorry again for a long story, but it helps me remember details if I tell the whole thing. I'm from South Jersey, and spent a lot of time in the Pine Barrens camping, hiking, and off-roading in my Jeep. I started spending more time at Brennan T. Byrne State Forest over the last few years because of the off-road trails. There's a lake called Packham Pond along one of the main roads in the park, and it's a great place to go and park to look up at the stars. 
Something of note is that the state forest is very close, approximately 15 miles from Joint Base McGuire slash Fort Dix. To get right to it, I've seen strange, unexplainable lights in the trees in different areas of the forest. The first few times were while parked at Packham Pond and stargazing. I noticed small lights that would sometimes flicker or stay stationary just below the tree line, easily mistakable for stars. I didn't think much of it until I realized that during the daytime, the tree line was high enough that there's no way I could have been seeing stars through the thick foliage and tree line. I brought my wife with me the next time, specifically to try to show her these strange lights. And sure enough, they were there. And sure enough, they were there. Not in the same spots. They seemingly move. Two years later, and I just went camping on Thanksgiving Eve with my old friend, and the park was pretty much empty because it was 30 degrees. All night long, I could see the lights in the trees below the tree line. They perplex me. I have no clue what they are. I can't find anything online about this, so I think I need to do my own investigation. I don't know what to think of them, except possibly some sort of light being or fairies. That sounds ridiculous to say, but they seem paranormal in nature. Anyone have any ideas about what these are? Anyone have a similar experience in the Pine Barrens or anywhere else? I live in Vermont and grew up here nearly my entire life. I've always been at home in the woods. It's always made me feel calm, and I've never really feared being in the woods, especially in the daytime. Vermont doesn't have much to fear, nature-wise. I don't have the ability to be silent, but I am very aware of my noise level as well as the sounds of the woods. I've had the woods go quiet on me a few times, but if you stop moving, the sounds of the woods come back usually within a minute. Twice, I have experienced the woods go absolutely silent and felt uneasy. The first time was when I was hiking with my then-girlfriend up Mount Abe, maybe in 2012. There's a section of the trail that is really unique and beautiful. The woods becomes less thick, and moss covers most of the ground that you can see. We're hiking through this area. The woods go quiet, and we both come to a stop. She asked if I felt that. I said something didn't seem right, but I laughed it off, and jokingly attributed the silence to me huffing. We started off again with her still in front. The quiet didn't end, and I kept feeling like someone was there, looking over my shoulder frequently. This section of the trail isn't terribly long, maybe a half hour, but time seemed to be as still as the air. We finally got to the intersection of the next trail and we stopped again. Just up the trail, not 30 feet away, we both saw someone run across the trail and go behind a small dead tree. They poked their head out partially from behind it and retracted back behind the tree. This tree would have been hard for anyone, but a child to hide behind. Without thinking, I walked past her, marched over to the tree and looked around it. Nothing. The woods woke back up almost immediately. I walked back to her and discussed the whole thing. We both felt like this section of the path seemed to take way longer than it should have. We both noticed how uneasy the silence felt almost like we were not alone. We both saw someone run behind the tree and peer around. We didn't know what to think, so we tried to laugh it off. Hiked the rest of the way up to the peak. We ate, chilled for a bit at the top, and went back the way we came without anything happening. I've hiked through there after that, and never had anything happen again. The second time was in fall of 2016. I was out behind my apartment that had a huge area of woods. The nearest road straight back was a little more than three miles east. North and south was maybe ten plus miles of total woods between roads. So I'm out maybe a mile deep walking one day. The woods were alive with birds, squirrels, and chipmunks all getting ready for winter. Instantly the woods go silent. I stop to let it wake up, thinking it was me rustling the weaves and down twigs. I hear something slowly walking up, stop somewhere behind me. I look around, and nothing. The woods stays quiet. I walk a little further, stop again, 
and once again, something walking and stopping, but still not visible. I did this a few more times with the same results. I began to get more concerned and cut north to make my way down the ravine and back west. I get out of the ravine and stop once again. The woods is still quiet. I hear something making its way down in heavy landings in the leaves. I booked it in a very random zigzag way all the way back to my apartment. Again, I went out after it and never experienced that again. The state says that we don't have cougars or mountain lions, and I think I would have known if it was a bear or coyote early on. Alaska is a perfect place to go if you want to get away from the rest of the world. As America's least densely populated state, you have plenty of breathing room for any kind of authority or prying eyes that may want to know what you're up to. For this reason, my home state is very attractive to all sorts of weird and unsavory groups. I've stumbled across Scientology centers at the end of a dirt track road with nothing else for miles around. Heard stories from doomsday preppers who claim to have bunkers made out of shipping containers in the sides of mountains. And met people who have come out of religious cults in the interior that wanted to keep their followers away from any contact with the outside world. All of this and more you can find in Alaska. I was born and raised in Anchorage, the only big city in the state. Growing up, we had about 250,000 people in a city it takes about 30 minutes tops to drive across. So that gives you an idea for what we up north consider a big city. The only other real city in the state is Fairbanks. These two cities are connected by 360 miles of two-lane highway. It's a seven-hour drive one way to get between them through one of the most beautiful landscapes on the planet. Mountains rise up on either side of you between Anchorage and Denali National Park. Before you drive through these colossal canyons carved out of the rock over tens of thousands of years, by melting glaciers and rivers. Past Denali is another three hours of driving through a vast, flat, interior plain with mountains in the distance. I tell you all this to help you understand just how desolate it feels in Alaska, even on the highway. After you get out of Anchorage or Fairbanks, there is nothing but wilderness as far as the eye can see, save for the occasional small town with a max population of about a thousand people on a good day. Ten years back, it was even less. Alaskan girls are built tough. We change tires. We hunt. Fish. Camp. And generally have a great appreciation for the great outdoors that women in the lower 48 don't really have if they're near a city. The joke is that Anchorage is the biggest rural city in the country. All this brings context to the following story. In high school, things were different. Or at least they felt different. I was a young and stupid woman who thought I could conquer anything due to the aforementioned built tough attitude I was raised with. Senior year of high school, I decided to treat myself to a camping trip into the mountains up past Talkinta. Nothing fancy, just an overnight or two in the most beautiful state at the most beautiful time of year, mid-June. Going up north in peak summer here has a weird feeling to it. The sun never really sets. If you've ever seen the movie Midsummer, that's what it's like. It gets to about dusk and that's it. It's still bright and sunny out the whole night through. Shout out to readers in the far north of Scandinavia and Greenland. The false sense of security I had thinking that the midnight sunlight would mean safety probably nearly got me killed or worst. My second mistake was not telling anyone where I was going. I just packed up for my trip, stopped at Subway for a lunch, and headed out into the great beyond. The drive was fine. A solid two and a half hours of driving north along the highway took up most of the afternoon as I jammed out to the greatest hits from the radio on Cool 97.3. After you get through the Matsu Valley, you get into the mountains again. Tall spruce and evergreen trees line the road on both sides with the occasional empty space where there has been some clear-cut logging. All of this gives you a sense that while you're out in the wilderness, you're still connected to civilization in some way. 
This led me to my biggest mistake, not staying at the state park campground. I was in high school with only a part-time job and didn't want to pay the $15 overnight camp fee and was too scared to risk the fine. So I found a spot that looked good and pulled off the road. The map I got from my dad said there was an old mining site up a nearby mountain, so I decided that would be the best spot to head for an overnight. My logic must have been that it was badass to spend a night in a mining ghost town or something. Pulled off the road, packed up my backpack, put on some bug spray, grabbed my map and compass, and started off into the woods. Now, this hadn't been the first time I had done this. I've been on wilderness backpacking trips on my own with my dad through my childhood. I knew my orientation skills and had taken some wilderness survival courses at camp. I wasn't just some dumb blonde wandering off into the woods with no idea of where I was. Or so I thought. A solid 45 minute hike up into the hills, and I finally made it to where my old mining camp was supposed to be. There was nothing there. Just an old concrete fountain with some holes in it and nothing else. I was very disappointed, but unsurprised at the outcome. I set up camp off in the woods and set to building a fire for dinner on the concrete slab. Here, you're supposed to set up cooking a ways off from your camp, just in case bears are nosy. Last thing you want is a 1,300-pound grizzly poking his nose in your tent wondering why you smell like Campbell's soup and s'mores. By this time, it was getting late, about 10 p.m., but the sun was still high in the sky, and by the time dinner was over, it was nearly 11. I was starving and dug in, About an hour later, it was about as dark as it was going to get, so I hunkered down in my tent for the night, confident that the overgrowth was private enough for whatever animals might come out around then. I woke to voices in the distance, and slow-moving crashing through the underbrush. My first thought was hunters. My dad and I had run into a few on some campouts, so it wasn't uncommon. I relaxed and figured they would just pass through without incident and close my eyes again. That's when they found my fire pit. A man's voice cried out into the brightest forest. Who the F is camping on our property? I froze. I knew I had messed up and was getting up, grabbing my purse and putting on my shoes so I could go apologize before I heard the man again. When we find you, you're dead. You're on private militia property and trespassers get shot. That's when the whole situation changed. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't just pack up my tent and stuff with some armed guy lurking around. I carefully put my shoes on, put my keys in my purse, and slunk away into the underbrush as quietly as I could. My thought was to slip away, wait until they got bored and left, then go back, pack up, and leave. I spent 20 minutes hunkered behind a log in the woods, barely in earshot before I heard a second voice calling for the others. They had found my tent and were tearing it apart going through my stuff. I heard one shout out, bed still warm. And, trespassers a chick, she left her underwear. The first man shouted out, okay, fan out and find her. Bitch thinks she can trespass and then there's going to be hell to pay. At that point, I wasn't concerned that I had left my spare change of underwear in my bag or that these creeps had found it. I needed to get out of there. Quietly, I made my way down the mountain for a good 30 minutes, tiptoeing and taking care not to step on twigs or make a ruckus. After the rustling and shouting of the men had faded quite a bit, I said F it and booked it as fast as I could in the midnight sun down the hills. I tripped and fell and got scraped up more times than I'd care to remember. Finally, I made it back to the road, but much to my horror, there was no car. I knew I had come out, up or down the road from where I had been. I couldn't quite remember where I was at the time, but picked a direction and started walking. I rounded a corner on the road and saw my car, and the two men standing beside it. They were armed and dressed in surplus military gear. I hid in the brush on the side of the road and watched. A while later, several more men appeared from the trail I had taken. They dumped all my stuff next to my car hopped back on their ATVs and drove off. I went up to my car, careful not to be seen, and found a note on my dashboard. It read something like, 
If we ever catch you on our property again, we won't hesitate to use force. Consider this a warning. I went back to start loading stuff into my car and noticed what they had done. They'd cut up or destroyed all of my gear, probably as punishment for trespassing. Honestly, I'm thankful they did that, because I'm grateful I didn't get shot. Ever since then, I have taken great care to camp only in designated camping areas. I posted this as a reply to an Ask Reddit question and was told you guys might enjoy it. So, enjoy reading about one of the most nerve-wracking experiences of my life. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It's about 166 miles long and runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forests from Roanoke County to Piersburg in Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. Perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful. Just your typical hike. But our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. So we decided to ignore these suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2 a.m. I was awoken by my girlfriend shaking me awake, telling me, get your gun. Someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 and a judge with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the judge out of my pack, and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing, but the breeze blowing through the trees, and I heard it. Snap. Crunch. Snap. Someone, or something, walking in the woods behind our tent. I got the flashlight and silently made my way out of the tent. Our fire had went out so it was nearly pitch black, illuminated by only the dim glow of the October moon. I told my girlfriend to stay put while I checked it out. I didn't flick the flashlight on right away so as not to give away that I was out of the tent and have it become a shining beacon of my location. Instead, I waited to hear more noises. After a few minutes, snap, crunch, crack. It sounded like it was bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought that I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever it was out there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up setting guard outside the tent in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print and some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. 
it wasn't mine and it wasn't my girlfriend's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day, we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point, I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this, as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I gave my girl the 1911, and I kept the judge right next to me, and I assured her that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep, and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me, and I drifted off. I awoke some time later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend up, shushing her to be quiet. From the faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There really was someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed. Get the F out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction whoever was out there had fled. They had a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods, hearing branches snap for quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure that nobody was coming up on us. It was completely nerve-wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere, and quite literally on our own, since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there. I really felt like we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time, when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up, and barely any light. I couldn't make out the features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second, and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us, and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me that they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for a clan of cannibalistic and bred hillbillies, which is what I pictured happening in my head the whole time. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was someone just messing with us. Maybe it really was a clan of deformed hillbillies who were hunting us. I'll never know because I will not be returning to find out. Also, I've probably missed a detail here and there. If you have any questions, just ask, and I'll do my best to answer. I'm 19 and live in West Yorkshire. I won't say where specifically due to privacy concerns, but I will tell you about the woods. The woods in question are small, less than two kilometers deep and about two to three kilometers wide going in an east to west direction. For all intents and purposes, they are harmless. Perhaps the odd homeless person makes camp there, but not often, part and parcel of woodlands. 
It's also important to note that these woods are, compared to other leisurely stroll along a flat path type woods, quite strenuous. There are two hills, an extremely steep one, at a severe incline, and the other, a much more reasonable slope. I had played in these woods as a kid and knew them very well, so I should have been comfortable. However, on this day, I felt extremely uneasy during the walkthrough. This walk takes all of five minutes and is a nice end to a decent two mile walk. The day in question, however, I could not shake the feeling that I was being followed. And when I heard a crack of a twig, I legged it through to the other side. I heard more twigs cracking in quick succession, so I'm certain I was being followed. Why, I don't know, but I refuse to go through those woods without my dog with me. Am I being irrational, or do I have a well-founded fear? My friend and I were walking our dogs where the old sanitarium used to be. Now it's a wooded area on the edge of town. It always felt a little creepy to me. My Rottweiler Lab Cross, Susie Q, always wanted to take this certain path, but it was usually swampy so I wouldn't let her. One day in the fall it dried up, so this time I let her go and followed. We found bed sheets made into a noose hanging from a tree. It looked really creepy. I took a picture of it. There was also a rotting mattress and garbage strewn about. Very weird vibe there, and I did not like it at all. Fast forward to the following summer. Again, my friend and I were walking the dogs. When we came to the fork in the path where Susie Q always wanted to go, I heard noises. It was that of an old man, 60s or so. His voice sounded rather grovelly, with two young girls around 10 years old. They were on the path, but turned back going in deeper into the woods, to the place where I saw the noose. I stopped and wondered if I should do something. It just felt wrong. My friend told me to forget it and kept walking. As I stood there wrestling with my conscience and wondering if I should call the cops because it seemed inappropriate, I heard rustling noises in the bushes behind me. Turning, I saw a young girl about 11 or 12. She had lots of freckles and stringy red hair that hung to her shoulders. Her head was down, and she was looking at me through her bangs. She was wearing a red striped t-shirt, jeans, and runners. Her hands hung by her side and fists, and that was when I noticed that she had a red Victoria Knox knife in her right hand with the blade out. She just kept walking towards me with this weird look, not saying anything. I thought to myself, geez, Am I going to have to fight a little girl? One with a freaking knife? Just then, Susie Q came bounding back with the other dog, Dory, and the little girl stepped backwards back into the bush without taking her eyes off of me until she disappeared into the foliage. I caught up with my friend, moving rather quickly, and told him what had happened. He agreed it was freaking weird, and we headed back home. But I still think about that day, and wonder what the hell it was all about. As much as I love the stories on this thread, I wish more of them had an explanation for the occurrence. So I'll tell a story where I found out what really was going on. I'm a 24 year old male and I've been backpacking my whole life and I'm very comfortable in secluded places. About a year ago, I went on a two night trip with some friends in Southwestern the United States. We arrived at the trailhead late afternoon and decided to camp about a quarter mile up the trail at a small area with around three tent sites. Next to our site was a barren stream with a small hill. At the top, you could see the silhouette of a little cottage. After getting up and eating dinner, 
We cracked a few cold ones and sat around the fire as per usual. A little time passed and we hear some activity coming from where the cabin is. At first it was just the chatter of voices, but soon it changed into some sort of group laughter, almost as a chant. It was a very forced laugh, with several people in unison, which lasted maybe five to ten seconds. Pause, and again. At first we assumed that someone cracked a good joke at a cabin, but after 30 minutes or so it became very weird. At this point, it is quite late, probably around 11 p.m., and we decided we had to find out what was going on. We crept across the barren river, and up the hill almost to the crest, where we peered over. We were able to make out about 20 people sitting in a circle, laughing in rhythm with one another. I want to make it clear, it was a very creepy laugh, not the natural type, more of a hoo-hoo-hoo. Anyway, we head back to our site and write it off as some weird stuff, but probably nothing to be worried about. Before sleeping, we went down to where we parked and sparked up a joint. Out from the woods comes two guys, seemingly from the direction the cabin was in. One of my friends goes, Hey, were you guys at the cabin up there? And the individuals responded, yes. My friend continues, what were you guys doing up there? And the guy responds, it was a native celebration for the full moon. It was not a full moon. Finally, my friends ask, how do you get involved with that? And the guy responds, you can sign up online. It only costs $50 and includes a dinner. The two individuals drove off, and we returned to our campsite laughing about the whole situation. All in all, it was definitely a bit strange, but nothing serious. Also, I took a video of the laughter when we approached. If people want to check it out, let me know and I'll attach it to this post. I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years and still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. I apologize for how long it is. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some time alone. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple of liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow, and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone, and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebrae from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew about how many miles we'd traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about three and a half miles, which matched what the map said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here is where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, 
my partner, Michael, slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so we wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off his injured ankle. Even though I'm shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace. But when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles, and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail, and well-maintained too. A big wide dirt track that followed the river, and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized. But what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have service. Michael was in a lot of pain, and struggled to put his weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trail, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest, and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights we had were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking towards the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, except the river and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled over that for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. 
Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I had just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead of us to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we had hiked nine total miles. After nine and a half miles, we finally saw the side for the trailhead and scrambled towards it. Relief didn't completely wash over me, though, because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge alongside the road for a few miles more. There was simply no way this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed a short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see my car. My prayers were answered. But it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you, and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Like your legs just won't cooperate, and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration, and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the National Forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. I grew up on the countryside, right next to a national park frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk or run. But ten-year-old me felt it was a stupid rule and did so anyway, because the trails were perfect for it. I knew fully well that I wasn't supposed to do that, and was caught a few times, but nothing much came of it apart from a half-hearted don't do it again. And I did, of course until one day something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders, and I would often take one of the horses for a ride, usually in the Forbidden Park. This day, very early morning, the first day of the summer holiday, it was beautiful outdoors, misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before six o'clock, I knew there wouldn't be anyone on the trail to see me, so I let the horse set off full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got steep on one side, leading down to the river, because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much, even for a kid with next to non-existing risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to take another step. I grew up with horses all my life and knew that that usually indicates that you need to investigate. Is there something with the hoofs? 
Did the horse spot something that spooked it? The hooves were fine, but the horse didn't move an inch. That's when I saw it. Something had set up a trap. A thin, sharp metal wire across the trail. A perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around but didn't see anyone. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove, so I led the horse around it. And to do so, I had to walk a bit into the wooden area on the side of the trail. That's when I heard the singing. There's a song called Hedge Tom to Goober, and it was that melody, but the lyrics were different and sung in a muffled, snickering voice. Today, I only remember parts of it, but to translate, it would have been something like, Hey, all you runners, come here passing. Let the lifeblood pour out. I, as silently as I could and with my heart in my throat, backed away, got up on the horse and hurried back the way that I came as fast as I could. I knew I had to tell someone about it, but that at the same time, wanting to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails. So now I had a problem. The old stories about a mad old man living in a shed in the woods, a shed that was once a cottage for the local hunter, came back to me as I hung on the horse for dear life. I got home and told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching we also found a spear-like pole in the ground. Right on the spot where you'd land if you came running and jumped over the fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. The area was searched and several similar traps found, but no sight of the old man. The following summer, though, there were big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found right under the water's surface, directly under that little tower you're supposed to dive from at the lake. And black garbage bags, filled with big rocks, were found on the narrow bridge crossing the river, so that if a card hit it, risk is it would have been gone off the road and into the water. Me and some good friends of mine were going to hike in five miles on a Friday, fish an inaccessible section of the river for a state record, and hike out on Sunday. I say it's inaccessible because the whole river gets pushed into a canyon for three miles, and the only way you can fish it is to stay in the water, occasionally swimming behind holes. Well, something happened and they couldn't come down till Saturday morning. I hiked in, made sure the trail was marked well for them, set up camp in the afternoon and took off the river to catch supper. I fished a few holes below camp to catch supper and ended up catching four over 20 inches. I cooked them up in a frying pan that I kept hidden back there and the sky started clouding up. Long black rolling clouds with a touch of green. I double checked my tarps, dug a shallow ditch around camp, made sure my tarp was hung well over the fire and then it came all of a sudden. It was blowing sideways, but I didn't worry. I know how to build strong shelters. I broke out the bottle of bourbon I rolled in the center of my bedroll, leaned back in my hammock and watched it just pour it down. The lightning was constant, and it started to crack all around me. I had a good view as twilight was starting off the tracks across the river. With a boom, I watched lightning strike the tracks and run right up the rails for 50 yards. I took a few long drinks out of the bottle and dozed off as the storm calmed down to a drizzle in the dark. I awoke to the steady dripping of rain falling off the timber of a storm long past in the pitch black. The fire had died down to just a glow of hot coals, and I didn't set my lantern out in the rain. I dug in the pocket of my hammock for my flashlight. I had the sense to put my pistol and flashlight before I dozed off in my hammock. As I was rolling out of my hammock, I heard a sound in front of me within 15 yards, and then a squeal to my right, and a growling slash purr. I soon heard it all around me. The hair started standing up on my neck as I couldn't place what kind of creatures made all those sounds, or could be that numerous. I sat real still, waiting on a moment for whatever it was to stop, 
where I could spot it with my flashlight and my gun. I turn on my light, and I saw eyes through the sights of my gun. Eyes about half a foot setting on the moss squalling, and I smiled. In my buzzed slash sleepy state, I had left the remainder of my fish sitting on the skillet in the rocks behind the fire, and a whole family of raccoons had sniffed them out. I took a few minutes to stoke the fire up with some dry pine, took the skillet full of fish and threw them just out of sight from the light of camp. With one loud crack, the mama called all the little ones to eat. The fire kept them too scared to come any closer, but they must have been hungry. I dozed back off in my hammock. The next morning I woke up and walked to where I had thrown the fish. They had cleaned up every fin, bone, and drop of grease and moved on with full bellies. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama, close to Birmingham. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother, who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles so seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with the rifle if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare, and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, Everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car. She must have known him. So my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they had just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for some target practice with the rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continued driving. The next day, my grandfather went out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one other thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop.
I live in the Yukon, and by my house is a wilderness trail. Great trail. Leads to a bunch of lakes. I take my dog on the trails every day. Usually I have to walk him for at least two hours because he's part husky and has energy for days. Getting him to turn around any earlier than an hour is a nightmare. One day we're headed to the trails. Doesn't seem like anyone else is around. Seems quieter than usual. We're maybe 10 minutes into our walk and we're on a trail that is completely surrounded by trees. My ears popped for some reason and it seems like the whole world's audio is turned off. Something also just feels off. I look down and my dog, who normally barks his butt off at any and all wild animals, is crouched down, hackles up, completely silent, and just looks up at me with distinctly fear-filled eyes. We turn around, and he is pulling me back towards the house. He runs into my room and hides under the bed. He will not come out. He's under there for a few hours. When he did come out, he just sat, staring out the window with his hackles up. He refused to go outside all night. Eventually, he got over it and relaxed. But even years later, he won't go down that one path. Hi everyone, I was visiting a rural area in a forest close to Warsaw PL yesterday. I've stumbled upon a bag, like a large non-translucent shopping bag, tossed in the bushes on the side of a forest path. There was a rotting carcass odor and I came to realize it was coming from the bag. I tried to peek inside using a stick, but it wasn't easy to open. Flies started coming out and to be honest, the gag reflex was too strong to continue. I've since left the area, but it's bothering me. Is it common to leave rotting animals like that instead of, I don't know, burying them? Or was this perhaps something more sinister? When I was six or seven, I remember walking on my grandparents' farm in the middle of nowhere, down the road to the barn, when all of a sudden I looked up and saw five to ten goat legs hanging from a tree. I screamed and screamed until my grandmother explained that it was a cultural thing that some of the people who helped out on her farm did. To this day, I still look at the tree expecting something. I love people's expressions of their culture. My six-year-old brain just wasn't prepared for it. Thank you to everyone who listened to the end of this video. Thank you so much. I appreciate you greatly. Also, I want to give a special shout out to our members. Thank you so much for being members. Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Sarah Rodriguez, Inner Scare Wifey, Chili, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Claire, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, The Grim Reaper's Nightmare, Simply Complicated, Tangela Young, Miss Cannabis, Anon Q, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Skin Crawler, Taryn, Ruby Wilson, Jennifer Moyer, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Cappy Karma, Paul Reese, via MASHK0101 and Honey Pond. I appreciate you all for being members so much, and thank you everyone who watched this video. I hope everyone has a good night. Enjoy the extra rain at the end. Good night, everybody.